uh, a different kind of topic uh, today, uh, Dr. Zain. Uh, uh, let's see, what do you call your ICAS lab? So it's PI, uh, PI, oh, Intelligent Circuits Architecture Systems. Yeah. But um, you, you guys have seen his bio and other things. Um, what is most exciting is that uh, Lamptin just won uh, a, uh, a career award, uh, which is from National Science Foundation. Uh, for any uh, junior faculty, this is something, you know, it's the best thing that can happen. And uh, it's a uh, mark that his research is, uh, you know, getting uh, noticed. And um, uh, so he's on to something very exciting. Uh, he already had a good group of students uh, doing exciting work, but now with uh, this uh, recognition, uh, uh, so it has a solid grounds. So congratulations and I'm glad you joined us here. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. I know a lot of you from the courses that you took from me and also happy to know some of the online folks here. Um, so my, as uh, Dr. Shet introduced, me and my lab. My lab works on three main domains, neuromorphic computing, edge computing, and in memory computing. Today, I'm going to talk about the edge computing side of the work. The carrier proposal that we just, the project that uh, we just talked about has neuromorphic and edge computing, and this is the edge computing side of it. Now, I'm going to start with the, what is the machine? I don't think there's anyone in this room that doesn't know how ubiquitous machine learning is. Uh, a lot of you have been using it. You do research on machine learning, a lot of you. And if not anything, you've been scared by it, at least. In media, you've seen that things are happening that can get out of control and whatever. I'm not that pessimistic, but at least you know about AI. It's everywhere. AI is a broad domain. It includes a lot of different uh, application and fields. I'm going to talk about two I want to call them, call them subdomains of AI, uh, which is computer vision and uh, language models. I'm going to go over some of the work that we have done in the past couple of years in these areas and some of the papers we have published and so on. So the two domains are computer vision and language models. Computer vision is being used in different industry. We have smart manufacturing, autonomous drones, self-driving cars, and so on. And we have language models used for translation. We have the generative chat bus. Probably the most well-known one is the chat GPT that you have used most probably. Um, so they are pretty useful. Uh, this we know. But something that might be new to you is that a lot of these applications, when it comes to real world applications, need to be deployed in device. And some of you might not even think about what it means to be have to have these machine learning models up in the device because you assume that we have computing systems, we have machine learning models, these models are being deployed on these computing systems, processors, and there we go. So what is the big deal? The big deal is that until recently, a lot of the devices like phones, smartphones, and smartwatches that we've been using, they have been simply input output devices. Okay. So a few years ago, if you asked Siri to do something, please don't say that. So if, if you asked her to do uh, send a query, uh, this query was sent to a server somewhere in Midwest or West Coast, I don't know. And the processing was happening there, and that server was coming back to your phone, and your phone was just doing input and output, get the data, send it to the server through the network, get it back, and then show it to the user. Okay. That has several challenges for many real-world applications, especially if they are uh, sensitive applications, mission-critical applications, like what? Like military applications, healthcare, space exploration, autonomous cars, because the most important thing for us is that for these kind of applications, we want them to be reliable. And we don't want to be worried about the internet connection, whether the server is available or not. That's one big challenge that we have. Another one is privacy, right? So the moment that the data leaves the device, you are, uh, you may be exposed to any kind of attacks and any kind of leaks that can happen. 
and for many applications it's important. But besides those kind of issues, um, for things like social robotics that we work um, on those projects, when you're dealing with users, a lot of um, countries, including the US, are putting laws that you can't send the data out of, out of the device because of the privacy of the people who are using those devices. Those information is personal information should remain in the device. And that means that if the data cannot leave the device, you cannot use, you cannot outsource the processing, basically. You have to do the processing on the device itself. Another reason it's important is performance. Um, you want it to be fast, you want it to be real time, and the response time can take longer if you have to go to a network and come back. And these are main challenges, right? We want it to be at the edge. Um, so now this kind of research can go towards two different directions. One is hardware design, and that's something like companies like Apple did, Google did. You know, in the recent years, you see the Google CPU, Apple Bionic chip. They're starting to build a specific hardware, computer hardware, for these kind of machine learning models, right? And that's why now we can use our phones to do some kind of machine learning processing locally because of that hardware effort that's been done. For this audience, I thought I don't want to talk about the hardware side. Although we do research on hardware and we publish papers actively on hardware design and we have our own kind of chip, uh, TPU chip in the lab and everything, that's, that's something that I don't want to talk about. I am mostly focusing on the software research that needs to be done and the algorithmic revision that needs to be done in this area as well. Because you can't simply take a large model and just hope that this can be deployed on a tiny device, right? You have to have some kind of compression. You have to have some kind of modification. You have to do some kind of refactoring because these kind of hardware is not your typical CPU that supports every kind of oppression, right? It's limited. And you have to be able to design your algorithms in a way that can fit in those kind of hardware that we have, okay? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Mostly software and system level innovations to deploy large model on smart devices. Now, before going there, because I'm not going to cover the hardware innovations, we're going to use off-the-shelf hardware, edge AI accelerators. So this is the setup that we have in the lab. You can see four different types of hardware. We have CPU, uh, which is this Raspberry Pi that you can see here. It uses this mobile CPU. We have Jetson Nano. Jetson Nano uses the CPU GPU architecture. We have USB accelerators like the Intel NCS2, which is a vision processing unit. And we have a TPU, which is a tensor processing unit. It's a TP, uh, USB accelerator that so you can connect to the CPU as a co-processor. And we can also have a CPU TPU board, which is a Coral dev board. These two guys are built by Google. This is built by Intel. This is built by NVIDIA. Also, this yellow component that you can see here is a multimeter that we use to get the power of these systems for our papers. Okay, so we do have a USB multimeter as well. These are pictures taken in my lab, and we put this picture in a couple of our papers, a few of our papers, to show the experimental setup that we have. All right, so we haven't designed these, but we also do research on designing things like this, which I'm not going to talk about today. All right, so let's go a little bit deeper into the architecture of these uh, types of hardware. I'm not going to go into the details. Each of these devices have their own workflow for deployment, and they have their own limitations. Intel, for example, uses a Movidius vision processing unit or BPU. It has different kinds of frequency. It has 700 megahertz frequency, it has four gigabyte of RAM. These are the specs of this device. And a lot of them, they have their own API. OpenGenerate, for example, a toolkit that we need to use for deploying machine learning models on these types of devices, okay? Now, another device is Jetson Nano. Jetson Nano has an ARM core, ARM processor that has four cores and it has 128 CUDA cores, which are the GPU cores that we have on this device. And you have to use NVIDIA Tensor RT for optimizing the model and deployment and all those stuff. So you can see that each of these companies, they come up with their own um, API. And one of the reasons that uh, software companies play an important role in this domain is because it's a difficult thing. This process of this deployment process, this end-to-end -end implementation, <laughs> typically needs to be done by software companies. And then they do design some hardware for desktop. Google is not, by any means, like Google is not a hardware company, but they have one of the most well-known hardware in the show, the Lynch's TPU. Okay. 
so they software companies trying to build hardware for their own platforms. Okay. The, the next one is the TPU. We have two types of TPUs. We have uh, the Coral TPU back in 2017. Google built the TPU, but that was a server TPU. And then later they uh, started to build smaller edge devices, edge TPUs, as you can see there, up there on the um, top right. This is a USB TPU, and this is a development board. And the thing with TPUs is that they use a systolic array in their architecture. So I'm not going to go there, but it's good to hear about these terms. Systolic array is used in the uh, TPUs, and they use quantization. So the precision of these devices is different too. So TPUs, 8-bit quantized uh, parameters, which are the weights and activations that they have in the uh, machine learning models. And for example, open uh, then NCS2 has a 16-bit floating point. They have different procedures, uh, each of these devices. All right, so with that information, high-level information about the devices that we, you are gonna see in this presentation, we're gonna go and move forward to the uh, kind of work that we did in two different domains, computer vision at the edge, and later natural language processing at the edge. Okay. So this is from some of the recent papers that we published in the last year and the year before that, uh, in which we use these kind of uh, hardware and we use them for different applications. The one application I'm gonna talk about today is the facial expression recognition application. So why did we decide to work on facial expression? It was because we were started a collaboration with a local company called Van Robotics. And Vine Robotics built this social robot that is called Abi. And Abi teaches math and reading uh, to K-5 students. Okay. Now, the way it works right now, they have some content that they uh, provide to the user, which is the student, and they ask some questions. The student provides some responses. It's kind of like a one-way communication. Robot asks students to do some things, and they do it. Now, our idea was uh, also they also thought about it, but in a different framework. They, they looked at this problem in a different way, but we're using machine learning to solve this problem. Uh, the idea was if we can get some feedback from the use, student who's using these devices, this robot, and if we see if they're frustrated or they're happy, then we can just adapt the content based on their mood, right? If they're happy, we give them a thumbs up, we say something nice, and we continue. If they're not happy, maybe we just give them a break and then say, say something encouraging. That was the idea. Now we wanted to do it through the facial expression and we wanted to do it at the edge here because of the privacy reason that I talked about, right? We had privacy issues, we don't wanna send the data out. Also, um, Abby already has a Raspberry Pi in it, as you can see here. And maybe you can't see it, but this board is somewhere here. And the idea was if we connect one of these USBs to Raspberry Pi that can work as a core processor and then we do facial expression recognition, we can make the RB smarter, right? But just connecting this USB without changing the system itself, okay? With minimal changes to the system, we can make it work. And also we want it to be fast and so on. That's why we didn't just use the Raspberry Pi that was already there because Pi was not fast enough. We wanted to incorporate these TPU or any kind of USB accelerator um, and integrate it with the existing system. All right. So for that, so the approach we chose to tackle this problem was we wanted to use a paradigm called neural architecture search. So neural architecture search is a method that you let a search algorithm to design a network for you instead of you doing it by try and error. Okay, you create a search space. That is the part of the expertise is important. You create a search space and let the, net, let the algorithm search within that space and choose the architecture that is the best fit for the fitness function that we have. Okay, and then we define different fitness functions for what you want to do. In this case, we used a VGG-like architecture. So we can see we have VGG blocks here. These blocks have two convolution layers. I hope you have some idea about convolutional neural networks. If you don't, it's gonna be a little bit difficult to appreciate what is happening here, but probably you have some idea about what CNNs are. And we don't have time to 
teach that here, right? This is a different uh, problem. Uh, so here we have VGG blocks. We have two convolution layers in each block. These um, science shows how many convolution layers we have. And then we can have different number of kernels. Okay, when we have six to 16, it means that you can have any number from six to 16. And also we have, the we have defined the steps here, not any numbers, you can have six to 16 with steps of two, for example. So this table is showing us the uh, range of the hyperparameter that we can have and the steps that we have here. All right, now something that we did was we had one block fixed. So we always have to have at least two convolution layers or one VGG block. But then we let the search algorithm to choose whether we want to have more of these blocks. So at most, you can have eight convolution layers, which means you have four blocks, each, each of which has two convolution layers. At least you can have two. Okay. In the fully connected layers, you have the fixed number of fully connected layers, but the number of nodes in it can change too. So we designed this search space, which we thought could be good enough for the task that we were targeting. All right. Now, from that point, we had to uh, come up with an innovative way to search this space. And the reason for that was because we didn't have a single objective optimization problem. We had a multi-objective optimization problem, which means we didn't want to have just an accurate model. We also wanted it to be fast, and we also wanted it to be power efficient because the energy efficiency can directly uh, lead to better power, better battery lifetime, okay? So the, the things that we cared about was accuracy, latency, and power. Now, this is gonna be a little bit challenging because the cost of measuring each of these metrics is different. The cost of measuring accuracy is different from the cost of measuring power. And by cost, in this case, I mean how long it takes to do that. So in accuracy, when we're Training the model, we can get the accuracy immediately. If you want to get the latency, we have to run the test. We have to get an average of the latency. It's a little bit more expensive, but not that much. Power is significantly more expensive because we have to use an external multimeter. We have to run it for three minutes for each model, get the power profile, get average of power profile. It's a process, right? So you don't want to run that process for 13 million possible configurations that you have. It's not practical. So we created this hierarchical search mechanism that starts with accuracy as the first fitness function and narrows down the space. So it says, okay, let me go from 13 million configurations to the top 1,000 models in terms of accuracy. Okay. Now within that 1,000 model, we can bring the device to the picture here. It's device agnostic, which is accuracy on server. Then we bring the device to the picture and we get the latency on the devices. We have a thousand models, a thousand models and we have five devices, but Jetson has two configuration, high power mode, a low power mode. So it means we have six platforms and a thousand models for six platforms. So we have to have 6,000 6, runs to get the latency. It's still a little bit more expensive than accuracy, but still doable, okay? And because it was doable to do that, we could run an exhaustive search there. In the first approach, 13 million configuration is outrageously high to do any kind of exhaustive search. And for that, we were using Bayesian optimization, a package called Hyperopt, we used that. And after that, we did an, did an exhaustive search, okay? In this second step, the fitness function is accuracy over latency. It means that the lower the latency, the better the score, or right? the higher the score. Same story for accuracy. In this case, we narrowed down the search, the possible uh, solutions from 1,000 solutions per device to 10 solutions per device, okay? So here we just send 10 configurations to each of these devices. So we're going from 6,000 runs to 60 runs. Now, in this step, we're adding power to the picture as well. So the, the new fitness function is accuracy over PDP, which is power times delay or latency. So the power is in the picture too. The lower the PDP, the higher the score, and that's what we want. We want it to be a low power, okay? So to measure the power, we have to go through the process of running the models for three minutes or more, getting the average, that's time consumed, okay? But after we're done with this step, we can find the best model per device 
best configuration per device uh, based on this fitness function that we have, which incorporates accuracy, latency, and power. That's what we need for edge. Make sense? Perfect. Perfect. I have a question about uh, so the model search is happening over the search space of already trained models. Is that the is that right? In the first step, no, it trains it. Okay. And then it gets accurate. But the first step involves training as well. After the second step, in this step, we don't retrain them. Second and third. So in that case, uh, this is just a, a thought experiment. In, in a machine learning paper, you the pipeline for deciding that CNN is best for image classification would involve data pre-processing, training, uh, validation, then testing, then logging other meta details. Mm -hmm. And so a pipeline centric uh, search um, space makes more sense in a, for machine learning uh, optimization problem than a model centric search space to me intuitively. So uh, I'm curious about the design choice here because the three things, accuracy, latency, and power consumption, you might have to compute for all these stages of a traditional machine learning training pipeline uh, instead of just the model uh, invocation phase, right? I see your point and there's value in doing that, right? I see that if you bring this uh, measurements to the pipeline and different stages of pipeline that can make more sense and probably gonna get more accurate results. I, I see the value in it, but then it's gonna be a little bit more time consuming. It's doable still. I'm not sure with the application, this sort of application, you're gonna see the value in it. Because soon you're gonna see that we get pretty good accuracies, even with this pipeline, which is, makes it not necessarily to bring that to the picture, but if the application is more complex, it might be better to do to bring this kind of measurement at least partially to the pipeline. It's a, it's a very valid question, and I think it's doable depending on the needs of the application. Okay, okay so now with that, uh, let us show you, remind you of the setup that we have. We have, uh, we use CK plus data set, which has seven classes for facial expression recognition. It's a relatively straightforward data set. It's in controlled environments, so it's not super challenging. Um, and these are the devices we chose. We, I, I went over these devices, I just want to remind you that this is the setup that we have. The last thing I want to mention is that Jetson has two modes. So all the results that we're going to show, we have a high power mode and low power mode. So you can see Jetson high and Jetson low in the results, and that's great. All right, so we start with accuracy. As I said, we brought it down to a thousand models for each of the devices. And what you're seeing here is 6,000 accuracy measurements. And different colors and shapes represent different devices. And we could see that we could achieve accuracies ranging from 88.32 to 99.49%, which is what you can see here. This is the range of the accuracy that we get across different devices. And um, the highest average accuracy, average accuracy means in those 1,000 models that we ran on, let's say Pi, we get the average accuracy for that device, okay? The highest average accuracy was 98.8% on Pi, Coral TP, and Coral Devport. So these are the devices that achieve the highest accuracy for us. And with that information, we went to the next step, which was latency. Now let's get the latest submission. Got the first step done. We are bringing the next metric to the picture. Okay. And that is latency. So latency, we uh, run each model for the entire data, test data set, and we get the time per inference per sample. Okay. The whole data set, and then we get an average. And this function that is this fitness function that I see here is an accuracy over latency. So accuracy is also still in the metric. And you can see that Coral Dev Port, which uses a TPU in its architecture, it's giving us the best score. Okay? And that is not necessarily because it has the best accuracy, it does. But this difference is not because of the accuracy, it's because of the latency. If you look at the previous figure, you can see that everything is around the same range accuracies. But not, now when we brought, brought the latest to the picture, you can see that it is coral that is different. Okay. So the fastest is obviously coral that as you can see here. And now let's bring power to the measurements. 
So in this figure, it's the figure that has power on the y-axis because accuracy over latency on the x-axis. And the best designs should be somewhere in here on the bottom right, because they have high score in accuracy over latency and they have low power. So we want it to be on the bottom right side of the figure. Okay. And we can see here we have the 10 devices. You can see the number of samples are smaller. If we are only pick or picking the top 10 configurations at the second stage. And uh, for the power, as I said, we run the multimeter for three minutes, we get the power profile and we get the average. You can see that the highest power consuming device is the Jetson Nano in the high power mode. It's faster though, but it's consumed more power. And the Coral Dev Board, not, all, not only it's good in terms of accuracy, but also it's good in terms of latency and power consumption. Okay. Now, if you want to summarize everything, we could see that the accuracy is uh, for Pi, Pi plus TP and dev board, we're getting the best accuracy. For the latency, dev board is giving us a significantly better latency compared to any other uh, device. And for the power consumption, we still see the same thing. The power consumption of dev board is the best one. And the Pi plus TPU, which is when we connect the USB accelerator uh, TPU USB accelerator with the Raspberry Pi it still consumes not that much power. Um, so it shows that TPU architecture is generally low power. All right. So this was great. We had this. And what we did, uh, we tried to integrate this with, this is the end of the first part of my presentation. So we integrated this with the Van Robotics robot. That was the whole idea, right? But it went through different steps. So we started with just connecting it to a camera and a display. And this is a USC Discovery 2023. Our students got the best research award in 2023 on the USC Discover. And this is Taki uh, you know, interacting with this uh, system that we built. And you can see these are displays, there are USBs, different USB connected to the TV. At this point, there was no um, robot in the picture. Later that year, which is almost two months after that, uh, two of my PhD students, Peyton, which are, who are here too, Peyton and Mohamed Reza, uh, integrated mostly Peyton led the integration part. The design part is mostly done by Mohamed Reza. Mohamed Reza was the one who did the neural architecture search. Peyton was the one who integrated the robot. Um, so we have, they participated in the design automation conference, which is the biggest conference, top tier conference in our field, at least. Uh, and we were one of the 10, 10 teams across the world who was selected for this demo. And we did the demo, we had some fun with Abby and it started interacting. I wanted to initially, when Dr. Shep invited me to this meeting, I wanted to bring Abby here, but then college asked us to give them a demo at 4 p.m. in the lab. So if you really like to interact with Abby, it's gonna be available at 4 p.m. our lab, you can stop by and then you can see how it works. Um, so we integrated that, we, we took Abby to CC Open House a few weeks ago and kids were having fun with that and you can see that it's working. So the system is already fully integrated, but it needs to be optimized. There's still a long way to go and you're still working on it. So this was the first part, but we got excited with the results that we got from TPU. We were like, okay, sure, this is interesting. Let's try and see if we can deploy large language models on it, right? Because TPU was showing us the best performance here and we, initiated that project. So this is the second part of the presentation, which is about natural language processing at the edge. And these are a couple of papers we published on in this field. We have some papers under review. And these works are well received as well. I'm gonna show you at the end some of the feedback that we have received. Now, uh, convolutional neural networks, which we use for image processing have been around since early nineties, okay? Now, in 2017, there was a new model called Transformer. How many of you have heard the name Transformer? Okay, good. So that's the backbone in GPT models and generative models. So you can see going from this, look at this, you can look at the graph, it's like blue models and the red ones are Transformer-based models. And they started dominating the field of natural language processing. And the version, which is called VIT, is also performing pretty well in computer vision tasks. And we thought, okay, let's try that because transformer seems to be the future. So let's see if we can deploy transformers on devices. Now, I'm gonna remind you, these are the devices that we have. There are two categories of devices you can see here, right? Raspberry Pi and Jetson Nano are general purpose uh, uh, edge devices, which are not necessarily designed for machine learning. 
just a CPU and a GPU, you can use it for anything. But then we have machine learning accelerators like TPU that we talked about. So with that, the problem that we have with transformers is that you can deploy uh, these transformers on CPU and GPU pretty easily, right? We don't have any challenges, they're very flexible, but they're typically pretty slow. Okay, that's the challenge. Now with TPU, soon we will learn that these hardware, this type of hardware is seeing an accelerator. It's not a machine learning accelerator. These are tuned, tailored for convolutional neural network and has a lot of limitations, okay? And we have to find a solution to fix that. If we, if we just accept the stack that we can run the TPU, all of these models that we had on the transformer side is gonna go. It's out of the picture, but we want them to be in the picture. We want them to be, uh, we wanted to be able to deploy them on the TPU as well. So now the problem that we have here, how we can deploy them, but the key word here was that we didn't want to change the architecture. Why? Because we didn't want to retrain these networks. Why? Because it's pretty expensive. So I'm going to refer to a, to a paper that published, that was published a few years ago, and it's a little bit old, but just take it with a grain of salt. Um, it did some measurement on the energy consumption of training these models. And at the time it says uh, the training a BERT model, which is not this extremely big model, it consumes the same energy that the flight from East Coast to West Coast has consumed. And just to clarify, I'm not saying the flight is efficient. I'm saying that the transformer is not very efficient to train, right? It's, it's, it's a pain to do it, okay? And for that reason, it's, it's the pre-trained model are dominating the field. Like a lot of people start working with pre-trained models. They don't want to retrain them. So if we could find a way to deploy these models without any retraining, without making any fundamental changes to the architecture, that was a jackpot. We could immediately use them in different applications. Now, the solution that we had was let's find what operations are not supported. And that's because HTPU only supports TF flight, which is a light version of TensorFlow. Now, TF flight only supports a subset of the TensorFlow operations. And the HTPU only supports a subset of TF light operations. <coughs> So you can easily see where the problem is, right? Now our solution was if you find these operations and try to approximate them or uh, refactor them in a way that they have the same mathematical, you know, they're, have, they're mathematically equivalent, but um, they're not using the same components, then they were good. We could use the components and operations that are supported and achieve the same mathematical relation that we need in the transformers, All right? So that was the idea. Now for that, for you get to appreciate what we've done, I'm gonna show you the, the typical encoder only large language model. It's an encoder only, bird like models are encoder only and they're used for things like intent recognition. They're heavily used in chatbots for intent recognition, for name and integer recognition. And they don't have the generative side. The reason we didn't care about the generative side at this point is because again, we have this vision of using an obby and down the road, and we don't want it to be wild and don't have any guardrails. It's important to have guardrails. We don't want to generate any kind of responses. So we cared about the intent recognition more than the generative side. That said, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that our methodology cannot be used for generative models. We actually tested it and it works for generative models as well, for encoder decoder models. Now in the encoder only models, when we deployed them on um, TPU. This is the mapping report that we could get. You can see layers like embeddings and the intermediate fully connected network, feed forward network, are not deployed on TPU. Okay, so we have to dig a little bit deeper to see what the problem is. So as you can see here, one of the components that is used in transformers is GLU activation function. That's where the nonlinearity comes to the picture. GLU is adding nonlinearity to the system activation function. Nonlinear activation function. What we noticed was that the, uh, the GLU is not supported by HTPU. Okay. So when we say it's not supported by HTPU, it means that HTP is designed for convolutional neural networks, right? And that means that they have activation functions that are typically used in CNNs, designed in the TPU, like sigmoid, hyperbolic tangent, WeLU, 
but they don't necessarily have GLU in it because CNNs don't necessarily use GLU. So they don't support it. So we have to find a way. We did a little bit of a literature review and we noticed that there's an approximation of a GLU that's called IGLU. And it's a polynomial approximation that uses this relationship that you can see here. And if you look at the function, it's pretty close, close enough. And we thought, okay, instead of this GLU that has this error function that it, this is a Gaussian error function, so instead of this Gaussian error function, let me just use this polynomial approximation and maybe it fixes the problem. Bad news though, is that within this function, we have sine and we have absolute value functions and those are not supported by TPU either, right? Because we don't need apps or we don't need sine in CNNs typically. Now, what we did in, at this stage was, let's get clever. Some, some bit communities is called uh, hacking the hardware. And what we did was we implement the sign function with hyperbolic tangents because TPU already has that function because using CNNs. And what we did, we multiplied x by a large number, which is 10 to the three in this case. And it pushes the tan h to a sign function. If you imagine a tan h, tan h has, is different from sign function in small numbers. So if you multiply it by a large number, you're kind of getting a sine function, okay? And so now we have the sine function. We wanted to implement the absolute function, which it was not supported. We multiplied X by the new sine function that we generated, which is based on hyperbolic tangent. And this is gonna give me an absolute function. You can figure out how it works, it's pretty simple. X times um, sine X is gonna give you the absolute X, okay? Um, now everything was implemented hyperbolic tangent. And then we could deploy it. Now we could deploy GP, uh, GLU or IGLU on TPU. But that was the, not the only problem. The other problem was going back to the BERT architecture, there are a lot of matrix matrix dot product operations that don't exist in convolutional neural networks. Okay. So what we did was we refactored these matrix matrix dot product with convolutional dot product by, you can simply do it, you can just, transpose the ways and then slide them over the input and it's as if you're doing a convolution, right? But by doing that, now our, my matrix matrix dot product was implemented as a convolution layer and TPU can implement convolution layers. Right. And the last challenge we had was memory. So a lot of these layer when made the matrices bigger, we didn't have enough memory for that. So we had to do partitioning and do it in a kind of sequential way. So you have the first partition done, then you have the second partition, and then you concatenate them. And this partition, when it's done, you don't have this memory violations and you're good. So by doing these refactorings and changing the computational graph and everything, what we could do was we had identified these two layers and we fixed it by partitioning, by refactoring, by changing the computational graph. And now we could, we did not get, it, get any compilation errors anymore. We could deploy models and we tested it with encoder only, encoder decoder uh, architecture, and it worked. Now, great, it works. Now let's profile it. Okay, we start with the latency, and we notice that for small models like BERT Tiny, which is still larger than a lot of CNNs that we have in the market, um, the fastest uh, design is the HTTP, the Coral Death Board. But when it gets bigger, the Jensen Nano is faster in implementing these models, okay? So this is something that has changed a little bit from the CNN because it's not as fast. But this being faster comes at a cost and that is the power dissipation. So if we look at the power, you can see that the Jetson, Jetson also consumes the highest power running these models. And looking at Coral, Coral is, is consuming the least power. Now we could make a test that we didn't necessarily do last time with the convolutional neural networks, and that was looking at the energy, which is the product of the latency and power. And the energy has implications for the how long we can run the system on battery. Okay. And if you look at the energy, you could see that the lowest energy consumption is for coral TP. So Coral was good in CNN implementation, perfect with this neural architecture. At the time, we didn't care about which device. We just wanted to do some neural architecture search. And we happened to find TPU as one of the best designs. With that motivation, we took it to large language models and we did this. We saw it's pretty hard to do it. 
But after doing it, you could see that it's pretty efficient. Now, with our mechanism, if we had TPU that could only support CNNs, now we could support transformers as well, and we can have real-time performance on these devices, and we have papers on their V and so on. Now, this side of the work is a little bit of bragging. Uh, uh, so uh, we also presented this work in different conferences. Basically, Muammar is did a lot of uh, this both side of the works. He was the co-author on this side. My, my student, Brendan Reedy, who was the person who had this idea, who led the idea. He's working with Synaptics right now. Mamarza was the co-author, and he presented this work in different conferences. It was running around the states from San Francisco to San Antonio to Orlando to present this work, some of these works that we have done. The credit of this work mostly goes to Brendan, and the credit of the first work mostly goes to Muhammad Reza. Uh, because he led that one, and uh, Brandon led this one, but you can see Muammar is presenting at different conferences. But we have received a lot of good feedback from the community. At the time when we were working on this project, we knew it's interesting, but we didn't know how interesting it is. And when we released it, we got uh, a lot of direct messages. On GitHub, you can say, this is not, we're not even there. And people are talking about, this is fixed. Go to this paper, they have, they found a way to fix it. We also work with, we presented this work in ISCA, and the co-founder of Google DeepMind was the one who put together that workshop. And he got super excited, so we had some discussion with, because they were behind the TPU, and they didn't even know that they can do these things with TPU, so they got very excited that we implement LLMs. We had some discussion with Georgia Tech at the time, I said we were we wanted to do it for a year, and we didn't know how to do it. So a lot of that goes to my student, Brenda, who did it, and we didn't, at the time we were presenting it, we were like, okay, cool, we did it. But now we're getting more and more attention and a lot of people are coming to us. We receive a lot of messages, great messages to get the code and everything. So I'm very proud of the work that we have done with it too. So with that, I'm gonna end the presentation. I think we're kind of on time. So we have like five minutes, I guess. Um, but yeah, I'm open for any questions. So I fundamentally didn't understand how a large language model which would have a much larger footprint in memory would fit on any of these things. Yeah, that's the thing, one of the things that we had to fix, right? So like if this is the problem that we had here, and and that's where we had to partition it. So these are the, the memory violation one of was one of the biggest challenges that we had. So we partitioned, we changed the computation graph and we partitioned them to smaller sizes and then we processed them one at a time. So you process this. Now the question is like how we fit the entire model, like in terms of where the base are stored. Well, the partitioning in any meaningful way would be some logical function that can, how would you be able to come up with a very, um, concrete partition uh, for anything. You're talking about the, uh, you know, compile large language model code, right? And how would you partition that in any meaningful way? How do you partition the matrices? The uh, large language model. So we were, we were actually partitioning the underlying components of it. So we have, for example, if we go back to this, we could see that we have matrix matrix multiplications and those were the main challenges. Right, because on the memory side, you either are connecting it with it with the Raspberry Pi that has a lot of memory, or you're either using DevPort that has a lot of memory. The challenge is not that we can't fit the model on the device. The challenge is that if you want to run it fast, you have to have it in the cache, right? So if you could have the matrix in the cache, the entire matrix in the cache, it's going to be significantly faster than half of the matrices in the cache. Half of it is in the main. What is the footprint of uh, large language model? I say GPT-3. What is the footprint? So GPT-3, I don't have it on top of my mind, but I can say GPT-2. We have different versions of that, that they have 1.7 billion parameters. And if you use quantization, you're talking about 1.7 gigabytes. That's it. Yeah. So like- And how much memory you have on these devices? You can have up to four gigabytes in some of them. So if you can fit the model in it, the problem is that if the matrix, and it comes to matrix multiplication, if the matrix, some part of it is in the main memory, it's challenging. 
if we partition the matrix, we move that in the cache and we do the processing and go and bring the other part of the matrix to the cache, it's gonna be significantly faster. That's what we're doing. So we could fit it on the device, but we couldn't, we, what we were trying to avoid was that to make it to be fast enough, we had to partition and make sure the entire matrix is done in the cache. <coughs> we don't have to go within the, within, in the middle of processing a matrix, we don't have to go to main memory. That's, that's a big pain. We wanna avoid that. Um, is such language models have been darling of, you know, I mean, it's, uh, very uh, successful in some sense, in the sense of language generation, particularly. Uh, uh, and, but more you look at it, the more problems you find with it, with hallucination, uh, safety, many other things. Uh, so I'm a believer in creating what we call as compact uh, custom models. So we won't be necessarily, uh, we won't have common crawl and train it on a common crawl with massive amount of, you know, many, many domains and everything covered. It won't be able to talk about everything. But the idea would be to uh, take a very specific application. Let's say uh, uh, screening for a particular uh, mental health condition or screening for uh, some chronic disease, let's say. And you're doing very specific tasks. Uh, and for that, uh, you are training on limited data and limited knowledge and heavily verifying because of you know, safety and other concern. And that, uh, now those models are you know, solving only limited problems and they will be smaller and um, much more nimble and flexible. And so, uh, I mean, and there is already a you know, concept of uh, having many models uh, you know, or many agents working together. So that's been there for a long time. But now it has again revived more for this kind of environment. So I think um, if you need more functions, add more models uh, that deal with those functions. But otherwise, you can have uh, you know small functions. So for example, uh, uh, I am interested in uh, you know uh, personal health, but I'm interested in the, uh, basically blood pressure or diabetes or such things. Then I basically download that particular module just dealing with that really specific condition. Okay. I'm monitoring X, Y, Z. And uh, there are some built-in sensors. There are some sensors that it, it can talk to on smartphone. And at most, I may wear a sensor uh, or two, or a patch or something. With that, all the data is available. And now uh, your model is computing all the things here. Um, so those models will become much more amenable to uh, you know, deployment on uh, very targeted small uh, devices uh, as opposed to these large language models. I see that you are, you know, able to fit in some of these things and you think that you can solve. I don't know in realistically how, how well this, uh, you know, it can give a response to arbitrary query and all that. That's true. There's something that I wanted to emphasize. I totally agree with that. I just want to say that if this is not even on the generative side. So one of the reasons that we didn't focus yeah. on the generative part was because this plug, we need it even in those cases because we have to, it is intent recognition. So it's like encoder. The decoder is supposed to generate the responses and that is exactly what we need to do. We have to put guardrails. We have to make sure that the database that I provide to it is, you know, is a healthy and clean data set, database. But in this case, it's mostly intent recognition. So intent recognition, um, you can just, because it's not generating anything, you can, you need to have it in any kind of chatbot. The generation part is a different kind of paradigm, which I totally agree. I was just talking with people the other day. And that's a domain that we don't even necessarily go to because it's like a beast by itself. It's an entire, there's an entire research that I'm working on. It. Uh, but the deployment of the intent recognition for us is something that needs to be done in any chatbot, no matter what. That's the beginning of the process. It's on the query, you understand the intent. What you do with the generation is a different problem no, no, itself. No, it really makes sense to give it passing for a I have a, a, a question about uh, there's a side of this where people change the model format so that it runs only on a CPU. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I, I'm not sure how relevant it is to this line of research, but it, that I assume also doesn't change the underlying architecture. For example, it goes from an interpreted language to a compiled language and from Python to C++. And sometimes even uh, 
something extremely crude, like change it to a string that can run on a hardware that is NAND or NOR based and return the output. So could you contrast this with those efforts or are they happening in parallel? They're not necessarily happening in parallel. The thing is that one idea is that if I want to use a CPU as a general purpose processor for that, I can go to intermediate representations or like simpler languages like C that are, that are lighter. Mm -hmm. And then that can run faster on CPU. You can always do that. But that is complementing this because if you, if you can, TPU is always going to be faster than CPU if done correctly. Because that is an application, a specific device. CPUs, you can make them faster, but you can deploy part of the computation on TPU if you want to do it. Now, in this case, we didn't want to do it because every time that they go back and forth between one component to another component, data transfer is going to be more extensive and you might as well stay in CPU, right? So we wanted to just go to TPU and stay in TPU and done with the computation. I think that type of research is done and I, I, I think it's not necessarily parallel. It can be complementary, but also it is parallel in the sense that they try to not even worry about any kind of hardware acceleration. Mm -hmm. let's, let's worry about GPU. Let's worry about, don't worry about TPU and GPU. Let me just work with my CPU, but let's make my code simpler. Mm -hmm. That can be done too. That is, that, is, that is kind of parallel and can be complementary in a way. Eric, do you have still a question? Uh, yeah, I was gonna yeah. ask, uh, so, you were testing the Coral Dev versus the Jetson Nano. Uh, did you run the modified architecture on the Jetson Nano as well? Because I think you can run like probably the GLU natively on the GPU. Yeah. So was it using the modified architecture? That's absolutely a great question because this is one of the questions that we got from one of the reviewers. Although it was accepted that they said that Maybe these modifications that we did for TPU make it faster on GPU as well. That's the point that we're making. We didn't have to, because for us at this point, we cared about compilation. The moment that it was compiled, it's okay, sure, GPU can support it. Let me go to TPU. But now going backward, and let's say if I use IGLU instead of GLU in Jetson, what, is it going to be faster or not? That's something that we haven't done, and we should have done, right? To, to, to have a fair comparison, because we're making some changes on the, on the architecture. If you go back to Jetson Nano, that might be a fast. So I, we had this chat with Brendan who led this project after we got this comment, because this is the first time it got declined from one conference and then we made some modification and got accepted. And one of the comments was that, and it's a very valid comment because some of these modifications, although we can compile it on Jetson, it doesn't mean that it's the best, the most optimized way of doing it on Jetson. I'm not sure if that was a question, but you know, we didn't investigate yeah, that. Pretty much. But I was, yeah, I was wondering if it was fair enough yeah. for the Jetson, I guess. So it was fair good. in the sense that the moment that it was compiled, it said, good, you can already compile it. Let me figure out with this guy who can't compile it. Uh, but it wasn't fair in the sense that after making these modifications to the model, we didn't go back and run the same exact model on Jetson Nano. And mostly we assume that it's not going to be more efficient. Yeah. Right? This was our assumption. That's why we didn't do it. But it would have been more interesting to do that and then have data to support our claim. So is it is it more of like a driver issue or is like the TPU missing like the actual hardware to run this? In some cases, for example, the case of the GBU is a TPU hardware issue. It's in case of... Uh, Convolutional neural networks is mostly a compiler issue because you can you can do that yourself. Like if you get a matrix matrix, the compiler could change it to a convolution. Even easier, partition, like forget about the convolution. Partitioning is something that you expect the compiler to do, right? This is our expectation of a good compiler to do the partitioning for us. So I, I would say, as, although we don't have good report and that's a problem with Coral, it doesn't give you a detailed report of what the problem is. Our uh, guess is that the GLU is a hardware problem. Partitioning is a compiler problem. Perfect. All right, great. Thank you. Oh, it was very exciting. And uh, let's, let's think about it. You know, this is what I said, custom model. And how we can, because if you can really deploy it, uh, you know, on the remote control thing, in fact, uh, in the 
Women go to the air and superpose and see how this thing fits. If your ideas are doing it. Like this, hands are Yeah. yeah.